Welcome to the Healthcare IT Today CIO podcast. I'm John Lynn, the founder and chief editor at Healthcare IT Today, and I'm excited to bring you the most practical healthcare CIO insights and perspectives. We know your job is challenging and we want to help you be more successful. And uh, today's guest is someone that I've really found fascinating over the years, has a great perspective, and it's Joel Vanko. He's SVP and Chief Information and Digital Officer at Bay State Health. Welcome, Joel. Thanks so much, John. It's a real pleasure to be here with you this morning. So, And good morning, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, well, we're recording kind of early for me, but that's fine. You know, yeah, the, we, we can always talk about healthcare IT, so <laughs> it's good. So tell us a little bit about yourself and Bay State Health for those that don't know you. Sure. Uh, so as you said, I'm the Senior Vice President, Chief Information and Digital Officer for Bay State Health. Um, I've been in healthcare basically all my career started um, uh, and we can get into that later if we need to or want to, but I started in medical school and, and found my way in um, really the, uh, the data uh, sort of domain, really chasing after information as it relates to improving healthcare. So I've been chasing after uh, knowledge and insight, data, information, interoperability for, for, for you know, almost two decades, I'd say, and wow. uh, found myself in, um, in the CIO role here. Uh, Bay State Health is a five uh, hospital health system uh, in Western Massachusetts, we, we service basically the, the the four five counties in Western Mass, uh, with some partnerships, of course, uh, and you know with the folks in Berkshires. But we have um, you know an academic medical center. We have a medical school that we started four years ago, which focuses on population health and uh, and primary care. And actually, that's really uh, I think one of the great things about Bay State Health is we're a leader in, in pop health, value based care, and primary care. Uh, the highest value health system actually in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. We also have about 98 medical groups kind of peppered around the region. Uh, we have a, a commercial health plan uh, that, we, um, that wow. we've owned for quite some time. Uh, so that pay provider uh, thing is, is, is really for us real and, and we're trying to figure out ways to, to really leverage that. And um, yeah, just happy to be here. It's, it's, uh, it's going to be a fun conversation. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Yeah, well, I love how in your intro, you talk about kind of where it's positioned in the state of Massachusetts and, and actually so close to Boston. So what's it like being a CIO of a health system that's so close to like all the healthcare innovation in Boston and what opportunities and, and maybe challenges does it provide? Yeah, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's like living in a shadow at some level, um, you know, at the very least, that's, that's what you could sort of sort of perceive it as, I guess, or, or you could take that perspective, but I saw it as really an opportunity. You know, like for example, in, in Massachusetts and in, in New England, I mean, we've got some great universities, but then you've got the, some of the greatest ones, right? Um, yeah, exactly. At, at Harvard, right? And so, you know, there are a lot of great ways to, um, to collaborate with those. Um, and, and I think that's kind of one of the things is, is the collaboration and the learnings is great. Um, it, it, but also, you know, I think we, we have at Bay State Health the ability to be more nimble in many ways than, mm. than some of these behemoths. And so um, we've sort of leveraged that uh, in, in connecting with folks who want to innovate or, you know, solve some of the problems that we see in a, um, you know, in a mid-sized health system. Because I'd say Bay State's sort of a mid-sized health system. We're about, yeah. you know, uh, three billion um, uh, in terms of, of revenue. And, and when you look at partners, uh, or actually uh, Mass General Brigham, uh, you know, they're, they're in the, what, 14 billion, 15 billion range. Yeah, and let's not even talk partners, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly right. That's exactly right. So, so you know, so I, I, think, I think we've got, um, you know, we've got that kind of uh, ability to be nimble, and, and I think we've leveraged that very, very well. And, and, and we do have a niche, you know, we have uh, a community here that we service, and, um, you know, we're, we're just far enough away from Boston where folks here really need a, a, a regional health system uh, to manage their care, to, um, you know, to be there for them. And so I think it's, um, it's really a great situation to be in. And, and I'll be the first to admit, I didn't know anything about Western Massachusetts until I moved out here because I was, you know, going to school in Boston. And, uh -huh. um, you know, it, even though it's a very, it's only 94 miles um, Bostonians don't tend to go um, past uh, Worcester, which is like, you know, <laughs> 30 miles. And after that, it's like, you know, who knows what's over there? It's like Mordor or something like that. Yeah, it's the rural area they don't know about, which isn't really rural. So. <laughs> That's right. It's not really rural at all. It's, you know, they, they do think that it, there's a rurality to it, but it's really not. So. Yeah, it's kind of like New York and upstate New York. You say upstate New York and they're like, yeah, you know, like 
30 minutes north. You're like, no. <laughs> yeah, it's perspective is interesting, but it's great that you have access to all that innovation and, you know, and, and the connections to it and, and resources, I imagine, through them. But I've also seen that, you know, you have your own Bay State Innovation Center and you're involved in a project called Harbor Health, which, as I understand, is really around kind of SDOH and things. Uh, you know, tell us about what are they doing, you know, in regards to health equity? I think it's such an important topic for people these days. Yeah. So, you know, um, you mentioned TechSpring, and I think it's it's worth just giving a little bit of, um, you know, uh, highlight on that. I know some folks, many folks probably know the work that we're doing at TechSpring because they've heard me speak about it. But um, so TechSpring is our innovation center that I started back in 2015 here at Bay State Health. And, um, you know, we were fortunate enough to get um, a, a large capital grant from the state to start it um, awesome. here in, in, you know, in the region outside of Boston, if you will. And, um, and again, you know, sort of the, the pitch to those that are innovating was that, look, you know, um, we're a, um, you know, sort of a, um, a health system that looks like many other health systems rather than kind of the unique um, health systems like a Partners or, or a Kaiser um, or a Geisinger even, um, and that, you know, you would want to uh, work with us and, and, and therefore help solve problems that relate to a mid-sized health system like a regional player like us, because there are a lot of others that would need um, similar um, solutions. And, and that hypothesis actually um, held very true. And so that's kind of the basis through which we connect with um, innovators who are both, you know, sort of mid to late stage startups to um, established uh, vendors and firms who, who want to create products um, for uh, and solutions for this kind of market. Um, and, and so, you know, we created TechSpring uh, and a model that enabled folks to connect with us, be a living, we become a living lab and an extension of their product development. And, um, you know, that's been very, uh, very successful and, and really beneficial for both parties and, accret and really accretive to, to both parties both in providing solutions, but also, of course, um, other types of value, uh, especially to the to those that are uh, doing innovation. Uh, are you creating of, your own solutions, or bringing in others, or a mixture of two? Is, what's the approach there? You know, initially it was it was really um, putting challenges out there, uh, and then having folks bring in their solutions. And what we found is kind of a mixture of a, a lot of those things, right? So. You know, we'll have folks bring in a solution and they'll say, we think this works for that problem. Uh, like, you know, I put a challenge out there, you know, help us with clinician burnout. And so they, uh, they would come with a solution and then they would test it out and, and redesign it in our, nice. um, in our health system. Um, we do sort of a, um, you know, a mix and match of, of, of solutions based on those that were in the innovation center and we thought hey you know maybe you two should get together and we and they okay. come up with a partnership and then create something bigger and then there are times where we did create something net new with some partners we recently one of the ones that we did was um you know a uh, uh, an opioid um uh app that uh, that focused on you know um uh, opioid uh, prescription and management and monitoring of opioids in, in patients. And uh, we did it with a company called Elimu, who's based out in um, uh, San Jose, and, and, uh, and they created uh, a fire-based app for, for our clinicians. But, nice. um, but that's sort of the, the, the idea and the intent. And then, of course, it's self-funded uh, based on um, the sponsorships we get for, for these projects and products. Because uh, we, we're not like some of these other innovation centers or, or, or health systems that have innovation centers. We didn't, we don't really have that kind of money to just drop in and say, hey, here's 100 million or 50 million, <laughs> even 10 million or 5 million, and, and let's do something interesting. So we needed to be practical and pragmatic about it. Um, now, to your question about Harbor Health, that's sort of the, the model that Harbor Health, um, you know, and the Clinton Foundation uh, recognized was a value to them. And so you know, this, 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 um, this program is really focused on, um, you know, Harbor Health and its, um, and its work in, in community health centers. It's a federally qualified um, a health center, uh, QHC. Uh, it's been around since I think the 60s. And uh, they created this, 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 um, this uh, program, I think, in, um, in partnership with the Clinton Foundation with um, with uh, uh, Mass Health Sciences, um, I'm sorry, I'm gonna I'm gonna sort of screw this up, but it's what's the uh, I'm trying to think here. It's um, Babson College, 
Mass eHealth Institute, and then, um, and of course, ha Harbor Health's there, and then TechSpring. And what they're using TechSpring for is really uh, to model that same thing, but for community health uh, centers specifically. So oh, interesting. I sort of talked about, um, you know, mid-market players like Bay State trying to create an innovation center. This is a really cool program where they're looking to uh, figure out how to create digital solutions specifically for, um, you know, community health centers. Uh, because they can't afford digital solutions and, and they really need innovation as well, right? So uh, we just started really this, this partnership with them uh, to, to uh, or they brought us in, in this partnership to help them create a model of an innovation center for Harbor Health, which could hopefully impact the rest of the community health centers and therefore impact uh, equity, uh, health equity specifically, uh, you know, through the use of digital capabilities and technologies. Yeah, well, it's interesting to think about the divide between, you know, even someone like Bay State, let alone a larger health system and an FQHC and the innovation they can do. But I think there's also a digital divide between patients, right? Uh, you know, between those who have technology or not, right? And I think Boston's a fascinating area because it is such a tech savvy and in, in many areas a fluent community, but there's probably a, a big divide between even Western Mass versus other areas. Uh, you know, talk to me about that and, and, you know, kind of what are you seeing and what do we need to do to narrow that divide? Yeah, you know, it, it's... I think it was really exposed um, starkly for me and, and for many of my colleagues during COVID, right? When, mm -hmm. when we all went digital and, um, you know, we saw access to health and access to care really for specific populations decline because they didn't have, um, you know, either access to the technology itself, they didn't have connectivity. Uh, and then there was also this notion of, you know, digital literacy that some just didn't have. I mean, they could yeah. have a device, but they didn't know how to you know, connect necessarily. So, it, it, you know, I, I think it was, it was, um, it was very um, stark and, and um, it was, it was very clear uh, in this area because of our population. Uh, we have a very a large Medicaid population. I mean, we also have a very affluent population. So what you saw was, you know, this, this digital divide and, and, and sort of health equity divide that, that um, was very, much uh, uh, resulting from uh, access to technology to get access to health and, and care. And so, you know, um, here in this, in this area, we've got um, a very diverse population. And, uh, you know, we've done a number of equity uh, studies to look at, you know, what are the, the, most, uh, the most fundamental issues for accessing um, health through technology? And a lot of it is, you know, I don't have a device. Um, I don't have connectivity or, or Wi-Fi that I can pay for. I have a, uh, you know, a cell phone that I pay monthly for. I certainly can't use that for a telehealth visit. <laughs> it's too expensive, right? So, right. Um, you know, a, a large there's a, a large number of folks um, in the uh, in the in the um, you know the uh, the, the African American, the Puerto Rican, um, and um, you know basically the, the the brown population, if you will, and um, you know, the diverse population, if, if, if I can use that term, uh, you know, is really the, the, the most impacted. And then when you look at that from a health equity perspective, they're the same individuals that have, um, you know, the, uh, the worst, um, you know, health statistics, even in COVID. When you look at COVID alone, you know, yeah. they're 1.7 times more likely to be admitted. They, they two plus percent more times likely to have, or not percent, two times more likely to extract COVID and have symptoms um, that are, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, you gotta, you gotta take care of them in the hospital. So, so there's, there's a real need for us to, 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 to reach out to those folks. And so we're looking at ways to, um, to work with partners like Xfinity to try to get, um, you know, broadband and, and, and Wi-Fi and, and connectivity in the hands of, of, of our, most needed, um, you know, needy populations, and and hopefully Bay State can be uh, sort of the uh, the core sponsor for that. Um, but if we can drive the cost down for that, then we could become the sponsor. We're also looking at ways to to provide folks who don't have access to, um, you know, devices or or can't use the device that they own to give them a device. I, I sort of call <laughs> it the digital first aid kit, right? I mean, uh -huh. you know, give them an iPad that's locked. 
in such a way where it's just purely all healthcare stuff, right? So then, you know, if, if you got to give it, if you got to give a monthly sort of, you know, fee to that, or we got to pay a monthly fee for that, then let's do it. Um, but that connects them to us when they need us the most, um, telemedically or uh, patient monitoring, or even just, uh, you know, a quick Q and A um, on, on something that they're seeing with their, with their child or whatever it is, an asynchronous visit. Um, so we're starting to look at those kinds of things, but we need, we just need a lot more focus on that. Healthcare needs to be designed for that. Uh, technologies need to be designed for that. And we need to have a way to, to provide that kind of capability to, to those in, most in need at a more affordable um, level. So lots yeah. of work still to be done there. Definitely. It's a challenging problem. Maybe, maybe some uh, FCC money for telehealth too. I don't know if you looked at that. That's another uh, one that I hear a lot of people talking about, uh, you know, the few hundred million dollars that they're spending, uh, you know, especially around telehealth and, and device connectivity. So yeah, yeah it's, it's a challenging problem, especially as a healthcare organization. How much do you want to be an IT organization? You know what I mean? An IT support network. Yeah, I think that's the challenge. Uh, how do you reconcile that in your mind? And you know, like, oh, do you have the ability and capabilities to support that type of, you know, IT outreach, if you will? Yeah. You know, so in the past, I've said to a board member, and maybe mistakenly, because uh, they kind of got freaked out. This was like in 2014, and I said, you know, we need to think about. Um, uh, you know, becoming being a software company that have that provides healthcare services, and and I was really just being provocative, but you know, I really sort of saw, saw on the horizon, you know, kind of this digital um, interplay and 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 really the digital focus for healthcare because that was really, to me, the only way that we're going to get um, true democratization of healthcare services is is to really. Um, kind of put a, uh, a digital backbone to it, much like travel and, and retail and other things, right? Um, and so, you know, I think that's really where healthcare is challenged, is that, um, you know, we are aspiring to be digital um, service providers uh, of our, you know, capability, which is health healthcare delivery and wellness delivery. But we have, um, you know, what I'll call an analog foundation that, that's mm. so legacy that we, we have, a, there's a lot of technical debt, there's a lot of cultural um, hesitance, and, um, you know, it, there's still a lot of challenges to, to overcome there, and, um, and, you know, a large challenge really truly is the affordability of getting um, a, an organization like a Bay State Health or any other health system to truly a, a digital uh, platform capability, and and you know, meanwhile you've got these um, these highly funded you know startups and players that are coming in, and and I sometimes call them ankle biters because they're like chipping away. <laughs> yeah, at, you know, some of our some of our services, whether it's primary care or you know behavioral health services or you know some gap services that may be home health related or whatever it is. Um, you know, we're going to start to see those. And, and, and I think that convenience capability and the, the digital and personalization capability they bring, you know, we're going to have to contend with, or it's going to be a problem for us. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm fascinated by uh, those ankle biters as well. And are they just going to chop off the most profitable parts of your health system? And then where does that leave us? I think it's a, a fascinating question to explore. Uh, just shifting gears a little, you know, as I was uh, researching and preparing for this, I, I discovered that you and your family immigrated to the U.S. in uh, 1978. Uh, I guess I'm aging you, but that's all right. Uh, <laughs> you didn't say still, you didn't how old I was, so that's, that's yeah, okay. Yeah, that's but, fair. Yeah. You still look young. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I think it's interesting, this whole immigrant mindset, and maybe I'm just a Hamilton level, lover, so it, it kind of kicks in too, right? But uh, do you think that immigrant mindset you know, kind of help make it possible for you to become CIO and, and kind of how has it changed your perspective as CIO? Yeah, I, I would, yeah, I, I would say this, I, I would say that um, the kind of the level of boldness that I think many of us in, in these positions have to have, uh, for me, I think I derived that from my parents and the inspiration um, that they gave me, um, you know, as they made the decision to Im immigrate um, from the Philippines, uh, which at the time was under martial law. And, you know, they didn't have a bad life. You know, um, my, my father was a banker there. My mom was, um, you know, an, an accountant. And, um, and they had a, they, you know, we had very good means. And, 
And yet he wanted, what he wanted for his kids was a better life for the future. And so, you know, um, when he came over here to the States um, in 78, he was, um, he became a bookkeeper, not a banker or an accountant, you know, because the, the college degree that he had there, which, you know, nowadays, I think those transfer much more easily. Um, the reciprocity wasn't the same. It wasn't seen to be the same. And his accent was so thick and he didn't really have good English and all these things, all these factors. But, you know, to have that kind of courage and boldness was just, you know, inspiring to me. And so whenever I think about, you know, um, uh, what I want to do or need to do um, as, a res- as a result of passion and mission in this, um, in this case in healthcare, I just think about um, you know the courage that that he and my mother um, you know mustered to, to 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 do something even bigger than what I think I'm trying to do, <laughs> and so I, I think that's really what led me to leadership positions was you know kind of being bold and um, you know and, and not sort of giving up, and so I, I credit that you know that um, to, to our immig- uh, sort of immigrant uh, status, I guess, or our, our, our immigrant background. But I also you know it, I also am reminded daily of of uh of what it means to be an immigrant what it means to be um you know in the minority and and i think my um desire to work on health equity and um, the digital divide uh, a lens of of um you know uh, equity and inclusion is 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 really uh something that i'm doubling down on and and it's because of that background and so i'm, I'm really passionate about that um, on top of the healthcare work that we're trying to to do just for this region so and in, in the industry yeah, I mean, as I've done all these uh, CIO podcasts and talked with lots of CIOs, I kind of see two CIOs. I see, I see the the bold and the ambitious CIO, and I see the keep the lights on CIO. Uh, kind of, you know. So I think it's interesting, uh, you know, and, and certainly even just from this conversation and other conversations we had, you're definitely in that category of bold and ambitious, uh, and I, I think that's to be applauded. <laughs> Thanks. No, I appreciate that. You know, it's. It doesn't always work in your favor, um, but I think I, <laughs> it's you know, sometimes I think hard, right? <laughs> it, is, it is hard. I mean, you know, you, you you get it's not an easy road for sure, and it can and you have to be very patient in, in healthcare mm-hmm. specifically because it's not the necessarily the fastest industry, mm-hmm. but boy, when when it makes strides like we're starting to make now, um, you know, it's that it's fun. The, the returns and the and the payback to the community and to and to the to the mission that you have. Uh, as an individual, as an organization, I think is, is, you know, um, 10x, 20x, whatever. I mean, whatever it is, it's, it's huge. Yeah. You know, those, those well, are it's kind of like a startup, right? It's a, when you're bold, you're going to have some failures and you're going to have some big wins, right? When you just keep the lights on, you know, there's not as much risk for good or bad, right? <laughs> like, That's right. That's you don't right. get the wins, you don't get the failures either. So. That's exactly right. You don't, you know, you, you don't, you, what is it? You, you, you don't miss the, the shots you don't take. Right. So. Yeah. No, that's great. Cool. So, uh, you know, as you look at your, you know, the work you're doing, what's the biggest problem or challenge that you're trying to solve at Bay State right now? So, you know, I, I think, um, you know, we're, we're still sort of in the thick of, of this pandemic and, and we're in the fourth wave now, um, which is really um, disheartening. Um, you know, in, in the, over the last four weeks, actually, we went from nine cases um, admitted to our, our inpatient facilities to 100 and over 104 wow. uh, in just a, a span of four and a half weeks, if you will. Um, and, you know, actually, the average age, by the way, has, uh, has decreased dramatically from, you know, when the first wave we had, I think it was like 60, let's call it 67, 70 years old was the average. The median was certainly around um um, you know, upper 60s. Now it's like closer to the the 40 range. Some t- some some weeks uh, it's 37, other weeks it's 42, 45. So definitely younger, most definitely unvaccinated. We have we have seen breakthrough cases, but most have have been um, you know kind of short uh, stints in the hospital, two to three days um, inpatient and then released. So um, you know we're seeing. I think the rest of the country is seeing now here. In Massachusetts uh, and in Western Mass, um, you know, the unvaccinated increasing their, um, uh, yep. their COVID exposure. So that's unfortunate. But that challenge, on top of what we're trying to do with, um, you know, with this organization uh, towards growth, you know, growing for our community, making sure that we're viable for our community, um, 
changing our chassis to a more digital um, and data-driven chassis so that we can be more, um, a, more of a consumer engaged health system. And meaning we wanna be you know, fully um, personalized for the individual. We wanna orchestrate care in, in a way that's, um, you know, that's, that's data-driven and, 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 and clinically standards-driven, um, but one that's easy to navigate and you know and keeps our population as well so there's a lot of work to be done there um because you know we're still on uh, the, the sort of the traditional healthcare chassis and we need to change that and transform it but i sort of harken back to or i go back to what i said before one of the challenges we have is you know there's a lot of technical debt there's a lot of you know even infrastructure debt outside of um, the technology the you know the facilities etc yeah, how do you how do you possibly um, you know uh, change all of that when you don't have deep pockets, right? Um, healthcare systems on average are somewhere between the range of like negative one percent margins to like you know two and a half percent margins. I mean, there are those, of course, that are. I was going to say, there's the, the divide there too, right? There's a huge divide. <laughs> That's right. That's absolutely right. That's absolutely right. I mean, it's a matter of as you know, it's a matter of uh, you know payer mix uh, patient. Um, uh, mix. Uh, and so in any event, um, you know, we're really focused on, on, on being there for our community and actually growing um, also beyond this community so that we can become, uh, you know, a, a more viable health system for, for the regions uh, around our, our core regions. So lots of, lots of great challenges. COVID is predominant um, right now. But, um, you know, we need to continue to transform like everybody else is. And that's a big challenge uh, for yeah. us right now. Do you have any keys to overcoming that, that kind of technical debt, that, that overhead? I mean, because it is such a challenge in many organizations. Uh, I love the illustration of like communication systems and, you know, a, a small hospital gets acquired and they still, they, or, they have 12 communication systems. And you look at that and you're like, no wonder it's hard to innovate, right? Like, right. And any thoughts on, on things you've seen work? Yeah. So, you know, certainly rationalization of those is, is a first, you know, step, right? App, application rationalization, uh, technology rationalization or tool rationalization, like in this case, um, you know, the, um, the communication systems. I mean, we, we still have like three or four. We had like yeah. 12 at one point, but, you know, and some of it, and there's so many interdependencies too, right? So you couldn't swap out some of the old communication systems because there's no new Wi-Fi yet in that area <laughs> of the hospital. So it's like, you know, but, you know, some of it is, um, I think, rationalization. But then I, I think you need to get into a new uh, level of partnership with some of um, these players who can do uh, either an MSSP type of arrangement with you or they've got uh, supply chain leverage. Um, you know, we're talking to, uh, I'm not going to, name any names right now, but we're talking to, to, to folks who can help us um, with some of this technical debt and uh, take mm -hmm. over some of that technical debt. And I think that's where you have to be. And, and I think, you know, I, I think a lot of vendors are realizing it's a zero sum game for, for many of us, right? Um, we just don't have the ability to add more expense. There's gotta be a way for us to partner on, on, on uh, taking risk and gain share approach models where, whereby, you know, uh, look, I've got X number of millions of dollars in technical debt. If you can reduce that and, um, you know, I can pay you um, less or whatever it is, and we have a partnership to do more, you know, does that sort of um, create a, a model for conversation that helps both parties, you know, and, and, and again, the math is going to be, that's the details, the devil in the details, but yeah. I think that's the, that's, that's the course of action that we can take because there's no way that we're going to catch up. You know, um, we have some some amount of capital every year as everybody does, but you also every year is another year of like you know a server that's that's aging, or a piece of equipment that's aging. And so, if you're at a clip of let's say, I don't know, uh, fifteen million dollars of capital a year, uh, you're never going to catch up to a technical debt. Um, you know, uh, balance of 25 million when it's, you know, it's always an additional five or t 7 million that's, uh, that's coming onto your, uh, on your sheet, you know, of technical debt. Yeah. So it's, it's a tough situation, but you gotta, you gotta partner, innovate. Um, those are the, those are the creative things that, um, I think, uh, bold CIOs need to do. Yeah. It's a great way to look at it and great way to describe the problem. 
So on your Twitter account, you've pinned this really interesting quote. You said it says, uh, "Your value does not decrease based on someone's inability to see your worth." Uh, love it. Really, really fascinating. Why is this quote so important to you that you you know you'd be willing to put it on your Twitter so everyone sees you when they when they when they follow you? And how do you use it in your leadership efforts? Yeah, uh, you know I. I, I think it speaks to it speaks to perseverance. It speaks to um, you know grit. It speaks to um, this notion of just believing um, in, in what you believe in, and and uh, and, and really, uh, if you have a passion or a purpose and mission, um, you know, keep at it. That's really to me why I put that up there for for me as a reminder, because I, you know I know my colleagues and I in IT will will. will um, will be familiar with this is that you know uh a lot of a lot of times um you know people in your um in your organizations you know the 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 only way that they really interact with you is when there's a downtime uh or not only way but typically that's when they see oh that's 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 the reminder of it it's like you know it's it's something's down or some some kind of issue um and uh, and I think I think it's just a reminder for folks, uh, particularly in, in in roles like us, in our role rather, you know, to always continue to to do the right thing and and persist, you know. Um, but it's also about, like I said, it's about perseverance and and, and I use the word bold. Um, you know, it's not always easy to go against the grain, right? So there's one thing about keeping the lights on, as you mentioned, but if you're uh, if you want to be a bold leader, you know, you have to continue to push change. And sometimes it's incremental. Sometimes you you get um, you know uh, uh, lashes in the, in your back because people don't understand at least at that point in time why you're doing something or why you're creating something. Um, but ultimately, if you believe in it, you persevere, and you're persistent and, and you're focused, things will start to work out. I'll give you an example. When I when I started the innovation center in 2015, um, folks were like, "What are you What are you doing? Is this, is this a playground? What What is this?" And the reason why I created that was because I saw all of these problems that we had in the health system and other health systems, and I wanted other folks to work with us and collaborate with us to solve it, you know, inside of the, the inside of the beast, right? Welcoming it, welcome, welcoming them into our organization and helping us try to solve these problems. Um, and, and only until I think 2019 and 2020, especially during the pandemic, did people realize all the things that we had been doing uh, through those years have really, um, you know, accumulated a benefit to the organization, uh, and one in which it created readiness uh, to, to to really go digital with it, even during uh, COVID, and even with our technical debt, if you will. So I would say that that's a large part of it, and I I use this quote for my to my kids also because it's like you know, with social media these days, I mean one yeah. tweet, one snap, <laughs> you know, one, one DM, it's like you feel uh, you feel crappy and you know, they don't know who you are as a person. Um, they don't know all the things that you do. And so if you believe in yourself, um, you know, that's the worth that, that you need to continue to, to focus on. And um, I think persistence will express it uh, to the rest of the world as you continue to, to push. So that's, yeah. that's why that, that quote is important <laughs> to me. No, I love it. Uh, I, I love it from a personal perspective because, uh, you know, I, I've learned myself through some of my own personal challenges, the importance of find, of knowing that my worth isn't determined by my title, by my success, by my, you know, whatever, right? It, my worth was determined well before that and that, I, you know, I have worth. And I think it's interesting applying that to an organization, the IT organization, often the worth of the IT organization isn't seen in the same way, you know, as humans, we're not seen and our worth may not be seen, especially, as you said, in social media. Uh, but you know, they only come to you when you, when there's problem, that, that's a fascinating way to look at it. And I, I love it. Uh, thanks so much, Joel, for uh, taking part in the CIO podcast. I appreciate you sharing all these insights and perspectives and thanks everyone for watching and subscribing to the podcast. If you want to find the rest of the episodes in the CIO podcast, you can check them out at healthcareittoday.com. Thanks, Joel. Thanks, John. It's a pleasure.